my name is Mary Miner, and I am uh, a designer. Um, I currently teach for the Art Institute, and um, in the fall, I will also join Susan at the University of Incarnate Word. Um, I also work in the industry, and I am... Uh, I work for a company called Indico. We specialize in K through 12 um, educational environments. And so uh, right now my days are really full because we're trying to get projects uh, finalized so that they can be installed over the summer. Um, I was trained as an architect um, and I fell into interior design, which was probably one of the best uh, things that has ever happened to me as a designer, it gives me a true appreciation for the built environment holistically. Um, and I, I feel like now I preach, um, every architect should also be an interior designer. It just makes you better designers overall. If you think about every aspect of the built environment. So today I have uh, been tasked with talking about lighting. And I don't feel like we can talk about lighting without talking about sustainability. Um, uh, so let me just dive right into it. Um, so what is light? Uh, light is, visible light refers to electromagnetic radiation. And you're gonna notice in the first couple of slides that uh, there's some technical terms um, that, Light is a complicated subject matter. Um, there are whole fields of designers who just specialize in light. Um, and of course, there's whole fields of physics and science that also specialize in light. But we can't really talk about light without really understanding the different ways to measure it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why there are so many different tools to measure light. Light's an, uh, an electromagnetic radiation similar to sound. Um, and the Light waves have high points that we call crests, and they also have low points. Um, and we call, similar to sound, the distance between one crest to the next a wavelength. And when we talk about the number of waves, uh, light waves, we call it frequency. And you will notice the similarity between the language um, of light and sound. The difference here also is though that light is made up of many colors. Um, and this is, as a designer, uh, one of our tasks is to help to manipulate uh, the built environment to take advantage or to minimize some of the color rendering that we see from light. Um, this graph on the right side of your slide shows you the spectrum of colors that we see in light. And there's a lot of research that goes into, or that focuses on the way that color of light and light itself affects both um, the physiognomy of the human body and also um, our physical uh, happiness, our physical well-being. This is a Plechnik's wheel of color that um, sort of takes the different uh, colors of light and, and assigns some of the different feelings and um, uh, emotions that we feel associated with color. Um, as a designer, when you go into a project, um, you're constantly solving problems. And the problem that you have been hired to solve oftentimes can be addressed with color in addition to all of the other interventions that we propose. So for example, when you're working in the medical field, there have been studies that show that the uh, colors of rooms will influence the amount of time that a patient takes to recover. Um, there's a lot of study in the autism design uh, field right now that shows the different colors that um, individuals and clients feel, um, well, the colors that can enhance their uh, experience inside of institutional uh, environments like schools. Um, so colors can make us feel happy. They can also make us feel sad. 
um, and they can make you hungry. And these things can be applied when you're in the hospitality industry. You'll notice that certain restaurant chains have certain color palettes and that is by design. If you don't think so, I would, I would encourage you to um, put your observation skills on the next time you go into a McDonald's and a Burger King and a Whataburger and just, you know, put your, um, put this, put it to the test. Um, color can also um, have a psychological effect um, and we can talk about things like joy and fear and sadness and anger and um, how we can use color of light to emphasize, like I said, the design problems that we are solving. Um, this is a little bit more about uh, the physiological and physical environment impacts and then the psychological impact. So you can see that um, there's hardly an uh, there's hardly a, a realm that's not affected by uh, light, and these are related to your room dimensions, um, your room colors, your room textures, um, the light sources that you specify to uh, to do perform different tasks and also to solve problems like task oriented lighting um, so that your light levels are uh, appropriate and that you are solving different problems. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But interior light planning delves really deeply into not just um, not just uh, assigning a light fixture, but also how can we maximize the benefits of light and minimize the problems sometimes that arise when light's not um, appropriately applied. So one of the things that we measure to help us understand um, color of light is called the light reflectance value. Um, you'll see that uh, as an acronym, LRV, and it refers to how light or dark a paint color is going to look uh, when light is applied to it. And again, you know, these things will have a physiological and a psychological effect. And as a designer, we really want to understand um, the impact of not just the way that light um, applies color to a surface, but also the, the specifications, the color specifications that we specify how they interact with light. And this, so I'll just show you a couple of examples of that. Um, this particular slide shows two different uh, paint colors and you'll notice that um, the sunbeam yellow has a light reflectance value of 70. And this is something that you will see specified on a really good, um, a good paint specification site. Uh, you'll see this indicated so that you will know that this color is reflecting a lot of light back into your room. So if you have an environment where there's not a lot of daylight or you want to amplify the daylight, um, this particular color is going to give you a good reflectance value. And um, the turquoise color that you see next to it has not too dark, but not too, not too bright of a light reflectance value. So it's still going to reflect a good amount of light, but it's going to mute the light a little bit. And, you know, there's environments where you want to take advantage of something that is in that light reflectance value field. Moving on to um, light reflectances that are lower than that, you can see that they absorb more light than reflect light. And this is also an important um, tool that we as designers use in environments where we want light to, um, we want to tone down the light. Um, you'll oftentimes see behind presentation walls, behind presentation screens, um, you can go one of two directions. And if you go the direction of light absorbance, then you're, you're maximizing your screen uh, reflectance and, and calling um, attention to your screen. And it really, it really helps 
uh, in a classroom environment um, or in a theater environment. And so there's different ways that we can use this light reflectance value, keeping in mind that light works like waves and our colors are gonna interact with the colors of light to either reflect or to absorb light. And as designers, um, we have to be really cognizant of these tools so that we apply them correctly and that we maximize their efficiency uh, in our design solutions. Color also has a temperature. So there's gonna be a lot of different ways that we think about light. And I think everyone is very familiar with the feeling of color temperature. And we all think about light in terms of warm or cool light. Um, and, and this is really easily understood with um, the graph on the right where you see how light can be warm or um, more golden in tone, or it can be cool or more blue in tone. And, you know, we think of warm uh, color temperatures when we think of traditional incandescent bulbs, because that traditional incandescent bulb was designed and, and reflects light very similar to um, the light of a candle. And, that light of a candle, it, it feels very warm to us both, you know, it's physically warm, but it also, it, it feels warm in its um, physiognomy. And cool light, by contrast, gives us a different kind of feeling and has a different application. So when we are specifying light, we are also, specifying color temperature. And we want to make sure that, you know, we've, we've ad addressed our lighting sources so that it is, again, going to support the task or the problem that we are trying to solve. And you can see in this that um, we measure Kelvins in a different way that we measure light reflectance value. So designers who specialize in light, they have a lot of um, numbers that they keep track of. Um, we also in light think about luminance and illuminance, and there's a difference here. Luminance is referring to the amount of light that is passing through the lamp, and illuminance it refers to the amount of light that's falling on a given surface. So we are, we're specifying how much light our our lamps are, are producing, but we're also thinking about how that interacts with the surfaces that it reflects off of, which is a really important part of design because you can't, one light bulb doesn't equal another light bulb. One lamp doesn't equal another lamp and every lamp is gonna um, perform a little bit differently. So we're also looking at luminance and illuminance. Um, Luminous, lum, lumens, and lumens are another measurement that we use. Um, gets a little bit, uh, it's, it gets a little bit tricky here. I'm just gonna go through this really quickly. If you're interested in it, I really uh, reach out to us and we can give you some resources where you can learn some more. But luminous flux is commonly called the light output and it, it's measured in lumens. Illuminance is measured in lux or foot candles. Um, and luminance is referred to as brightness and is measured in candelas per meter squared. Um, so if it sounds like physics, that's because it is. <laughs> and it's really fascinating to understand how all of these different tools, these different measurements are working together to create that one little environment in your living room or in your conference room or in your hospital room. So we're, as designers, we're keeping all of this in mind when we think about lighting design. One of the main things that we associate with lighting is our visual comfort. We've talked a little bit about light levels that um, uh, we need to understand luminance, but the more intense the task, the more bright the light required will be. Um, we talk about diffused light as general lighting because in general, we need a constant source of diffused lighting, even if we have some task lighting available. 
Um, and we also know that diffused light helps provide a sense of well-being because it it, mo it mimics daylight. And when we feel that sense of constant diffused lighting, we, we feel more um, in tune with our natural lighting environment. Um, we need contrast because light um, can help us to understand or perceive space. And I'll give you a really good example of contrast and how lighting is really important for that. Um, we do a lot of wayfinding in interior design, um, helping people to understand best ways to go places. And um, the contrast that we provide, high contrast, um, can help you to perceive things like stairs. And not just stairs, but how, what the depth of stairs are. And you'll notice that in a project, in fact, I think that you will notice this when it is poorly done. And when it's well done, you won't notice it because it's seamless. But in a poorly lit environment where there's not a lot of high contrast to your space, it's hard to perceive where the step is and you're gonna kind of think twice before you step down on that step. Um, so it's, it's a safety issue as well. Uh, the greater the contrast, the easier the comprehension, which is why you'll see sometimes um, that we go to great depths to provide a lot of contrast on things like stair risers. Um, glare, glare again is one of the things that we notice when it, when lighting design is done poorly. Glare is obviously undesirable um, because it impedes you from functioning the way that you know your space has been designed, and it can be reduced from lights with from multiple sources, and it can also be reduced from the proper placement of your lighting. And again. Um, the proper specification of your lamp, so your lamp output. And again, we can talk about color all day long as designers. Um, we color temperature and the way that it, we react to that is going to influence us um, in so many different ways. And experiments have revealed that um, we can even feel changes in temperature um, just from a different colors in our spaces. So you might have the same actual degree of a temperature, but in a space that is painted blue or green, um, we're going to feel cooler than in a space that has warmer, t warmer tones. And the way that um, light plays with its color temperature is all part of that process. This slide is uh, another example of how we can specify lighting for particular tasks or, or atmospheres and also indirect lighting for diffused uh, lighting environments. And um, localized lighting is, I think, uh, a really important part of projects that helps us to perform high intense task oriented functions um, and really supports your indirect lighting as well. Uh, one of the things that I'm gonna talk about in just a moment is the sustainability uh, factor of light. And it's important to have different sources of light from a sustainable point of view as well, because um, as I will talk about in just a second, um, Lighting is a huge part of the energy consumption of the built environment. And so being able to localize your light source is also a way to control your energy consumption. So we, it's important for us, not just from the mood and from the psychological effect, but also from a sustainable um, aspect. Activity-based lighting is lighting levels for different tasks. Um, as well as evenly diffused natural light. Um, and like we just talked about, it maximizes our individual control of your lighting and it creates a flexible lighting environment. Um, some of the important things that uh, design has integrated into, or the built environment has integrated into lighting design in the last couple of decades is, um, the kind of lighting controls that allow not just for us to 
dim lights, but also to change our um, relationship to the on and off switch. And so smart lighting has changed the commercial lighting um, environment tremendously. And um, you'll see a lot of um, a lot of lead type uh, codes that really focus on adding that into a project so that we can create a less energy a hog from our lighting system. And then some, again, some of the important things that we're looking for from our lighting design are to minimize your glare, both from your artificial light sources, but also from your natural light. And then maximize and specify proper reflectance of light on your wall surfaces um, and also to install accessible systems for at least 50% of your project floor areas. We take quality of light and quantity of light into account for good lighting projects. Um, quantities consist of illumination and distribution of light and then um, elements regarding quality are contrast, color, glare, or your visual comfort. Color render index is another way that we measure light. And the color render index shows the true colors of objects. So light sources will, light sources like incandescent and halogen light sources to have a coloring re uh, rendering index of 100. Typically, light sources with a color render, uh, render index of 80 to 90 are regarded as good light sources, and 90 plus are excellent. The general rule is the higher the CRI, the better. Um, and these images kind of show you the difference. Essentially, um, we are looking to, to maximize the true colors of objects within our um, lighting designs while also maximizing the energy efficiency. And sometimes this is a hard problem for us because naturally the light bulbs that are gonna be the most um, energy efficient sometimes are, it's hard to get really good color rendering indexes from those light sources. Incandescent bulbs are excellent sources, but they're terrible energy hogs. So, you know, as we move into uh, the era of LEDs, which they're getting much, much better at their CRIs, um, but we are, we're trying to find that happy balance because we want also to maximize the energy efficiency of your project. So, choosing the right light. Um, combines your right source technology with your right Lumiere and the appropriate controls so that you can address the function of your space and get also the right ambience and effect from your lighting. I want to talk just a little bit about some of the different ways that we experience light. Um, I'm going to start with the school environment because that's the industry that I work in. Um, daylighting is far and away the most important, well, first of all, lighting is one of, uh, has been shown in general as the most important um, impact on uh, the user of a space. Um, lighting makes the most impact. So if we can control lighting in a space, we are controlling how someone experiences their space. Uh, we're maximizing the way that someone experiences their space. And daylighting is a really important way, a really important thing for us to harness as designers. Um, it's really important for us in, uh, to understand that this is dependent on your location because obviously the sun, it performs differently in the south than it does in the north. It performs differently on one side of the hemisphere as um, opposed to the other. So it's, it's an important um, 
exercise to do a, a solar analysis of your site when thinking about how to maximize your daylighting. In San Antonio, we want to harness light from the north facing windows um, primarily, and we want to be really, uh, really intentional about the way that we access light from the south. One of the things that um, we've discovered uh, since the age of our glass buildings, our glass high rises, is that uh, when we focus only on daylight and we don't think about how um, light can also impact the temperature of buildings, um, we sometimes can create another problem with our lighting design. So, um, we have to be careful with harnessing southern facing light because sometimes we will end up running our air conditioners constantly. Um, so it's a it's it's a happy balance between daylighting and also controlling southern um, heat gain. You'll see in the diagram on the right some of the ways that you know we think about how we harness light where um, we make smaller apertures on the south side of buildings. Um, we think about uh, different ways like harnessing light from the ceilings or skinnier windows. Um, of all the design parameters though that we consider as designers lighting has uh, the strongest individual impact um, according to a really fun project uh, by a university in England. Um, they spent time really thinking about how people in, uh, enjoy the built environment and specifically students. And then they looked at student outcomes and uh, again, found that lighting impacted student outcomes uh, the most. You'll see in this particular uh, slide that different sections of the building will help you understand how you have light gain. Uh, the far left-hand corner you can see, um, we think about light in terms of how far it reaches, how deep it reaches into the room. Sometimes we want that shallowness and sometimes we want um, it to reach all the way to the back. You'll see on the right side of that particular diagram that there is um, a shading device built into the architecture, even though there's a window up there. And so we can understand, you know, that that particular side of the building, hopefully the architect intentionally designed that to protect it from something like southern facing sun. So um, top right hand side, you can see we're harnessing sun in a skylight and then where the sun might be more direct in the wintertime, I mean, in the summertime, because we know that in the southern hemisphere sometimes you know we've got the light coming into the windows at different angles um, so we're harnessing light in ways that's going to maximize how far it penetrates the room but then we're also um, thinking about um, heat gain um, and this is just a visual this is a light shelf this is one of my favorite design uh, interventions so the sunlight is it's reflecting off of the light shelf and reflecting off of the roof or the ceiling plane. And then it's going farther into the room than it would have if it just had a regular open window, a regular window pane. So there are ways that we can maximize daylight in environments because we know that daylight is that really important factor that's gonna impact school performance and happiness. So some of the different strategies that teachers can apply, understanding how to operate their shades, understanding what shades can do for them to minimize glare or to maximize um, a visibility of certain kinds of devices, having a high, um, a really high powered uh, the projector that can operate with windows with daylight is one of those really great inventions of this last decade. Um, minimizing the amount of decoration that you put on your windows so that you can harness the most of your daylight. Um, let's talk about work environments. I'm going to go a little bit faster because I'm noticing that it's 1230 and I want to um, 
get through a few more slides so we can talk about homes. Um, so lighting according to task in the work environment, you're going to see a couple of different slides that address um, the diffused lighting situation where we're trying to mimic daylight in the work environment, combine it with actual daylight. And then you'll also see in a lot of these workstations task lighting. So we're looking for absorption on certain system, on certain walls. We're looking for diffusion through certain types of materials and then reflectance um, in other situations. You'll see here in the top left hand corner that we've got our light source reflecting in a manner that is away from the eye plane. But then if we put that light in the wrong spot, that's going to the light reflects right back into your face. Um, also, we have sometimes issues with um, seeing or perceiving our screens, our computer screens, and it can oftentimes be a lighting issue. So we want our localized and general lighting to support our work functions and not to fight against us. We need a combination of all of the above. We need task lighting, workstation lighting, we need room lighting, and we need natural lighting. Okay. I'm gonna skip ahead just a little bit to talk about residential applications. Um, so layered lighting is important for all rooms in general, but in a residence, we do a lot of layered lighting to emphasize um, the, the functions and also wayfinding. And it can be accomplished with portable lumiers, or it can also be accomplished with um, several different kinds of light. You can see in the pictures, we've got a couple of different applications of um, lights along your floor bases and also lights that support um, spotlighting your art on your walls. Um, Hallways are important light, or let me go back just a second. Hallways are really important places where we want uh, to make sure lighting is applied carefully. They're transitional spaces, so we don't always spend a lot of time in them, but they're also um, our wayfinding tools. So we want to make sure that we understand uh, where we're headed. And, you know, entrances are usually around these kinds of areas and we can use light to create moments. Um, we can celebrate entrances and we can also, um, like I said, create a wayfinding tool so we understand where entrances are. Um, it's another application of what I consider to be kind of hallways. Repetition is a part of any design um, plan, and, and we do that in lighting a lot. It's a way to emphasize and also call attention to sometimes um, uh, the repetition can be very, very obvious and sometimes it's super subtle. Uh, in this uh, couple of pictures, you can see how lighting can be a real part of that design tool. Um, task lighting um, can be pendant based or ball sconce based. Um, we do a lot of down lighting in areas like kitchens and bathrooms because these are uh, similar to your work environment areas where we have a lot of focused tasks in the home environment. And um, and the pictures are usually located over the top of vanities or over the top of kitchen islands, over the top of dining room tables. Um, it can also be an accent. So we'll see uh, in the far right hand slide, the task lighting is mostly your can lighting, but your pendant is your accent. We spend a lot of time in our bedrooms, and this is one of the uh, spaces where lighting is designed to a safe environment. Um, there's a combination of lighting 
applications here where you're trying to support um, really accurate color rendering for tasks such as getting dressed, um, while also um, having things like dimmable lighting fixtures so that we can create um, that comfortable environment that, again, makes us feel safe. Um, for accurate vision, um, illumination should be diffused and oftentimes located next to the surface or the face of the wall. And that way we have less shadows. And you can see in some of these examples where sometimes the shadowing is an intentional design feature as well. This is just a couple more examples of um, some different illumination techniques based on the kind of tasks that we do in our homes. Again, dining room pendant lighting is generally used to emphasize the furniture um, of a space. I've been in some dining rooms where the home builder has placed the pendant light in a place where the dining room table doesn't fit. It's really hard to visually emphasize your furniture when your lighting and your furniture are not aligned. And again, task lighting um, applications in a kitchen. Stair wayfinding and emphasizing um, the function of stairwells. This is a health and safety issue where we really want to make sure that your lighting is helping someone perceive and also emphasizing that contrast so that we understand the depth of your stair treads. And again, there's a, a certain element of um, uh, ambient about lighting that can support sometimes not necessarily um, the function that we need for anything other than beauty. And I'm going to just go through a couple of commercial slides so you can see how uh, different lighting features are going to focus on um, the importance of overall light versus task light. This is a hospital environment where certain specific tasks need to be illuminated. Um, it, it's, again, a health and safety issue. Um, so you'll see certain light pictures for hospitals are very specific. And other functions where we want light to emphasize and create certain kinds of moods. I mean, light can also be um, a support, uh, the architecture of power, which you, I think you see in these couple of slides of boardrooms. This is some of the most fun lighting out there, light for our uh, hospitality industries. Um, and again, light can create these wonderful atmospheres and we have an opportunity to um, draw attention to the surface of the ceiling, which we don't oftentimes think of as individuals as another surface that to design. Um, and lighting designers do it so well. They really do not neglect ceiling design. All right, really quickly, I'm going to talk about sustainability and why it's important for us to um, focus on lighting um, as designers of the built environment. So I think inherently the field of interior design is has a sustainability issue because our field as a whole, um, we we contribute a lot to the landfill. Um, we, we work a lot in redesign. Um, we specify products and uh, manufacturers um, that use a lot of textiles and textiles is just a field where, you know, um, it has a high impact on our environment. And lighting is another one of those industries that has a high impact on energy consumption. Um, so if we, as a built environment, and this is um, some statistics from the global report from the WGDC from 2019, um, buildings, and construction to generate about 40% of the world's CO2 emissions. And lighting is a large part of energy use of a building. And if you think about the, the way that we as users and as specifiers of lighting can impact the amount of energy that buildings 
um, consume, is that there's a huge opportunity for us to design more sustainably. Um, we want to minimize the number, the amount, the volume, the weight, the toxicity, the use of materials, energy, and water um, in order to create the most green design that we can. Um, what does that mean? It means that we're thinking about indoor air quality and ventilation. We're thinking about thermal comfort. We're thinking about noise. We're thinking about how something looks and feels because wellness is definitely something that's part of sustainability. We're thinking about bringing nature in in terms of biophilia and um, how we as users connect to natural environment. We're thinking about what we talked about earlier with Ella's presentation about space planning and about active design, um, incorporating uh, mobility into the way that we experience the built environment. And we're thinking about daylighting and lighting. Um, so all of it together is really nothing alone is a green design. It's all working together to be something green. But green lighting specifically is going to provide a large part of the demand for cooling. So like I was talking about earlier, you can specify too much daylighting and then start to um, overload the, the heat of your building. We want to improve our natural lighting, both in quality and in quantity. We need to use energy efficient artificial lights. Um, dimmable lighting and individual controls are going to support energy efficiency. Individual control of lighting levels for different tasks. And then make sure that our daylighting is evenly diffused. Minimizing our glare. And using renewable or recyclable, lightweight, durable, non-polluting materials as much as possible. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to show you just a couple of nuts and bolts of lighting design. So, you know, design has our communication tools are oftentimes um, spread across many different industries. So the designer has to be able to communicate with the architects and with um, the uh, contractors. Um, and there's a lot of different contractors that are very interested in your lighting plan. So we use a lot of different symbols in our industry to uh, indicate what it is that we are planning. And, you know, lighting designers are oftentimes thinking about things like exit signs and uh, like I showed you before, your sprinkler system. So um, your legend, your reflected ceiling plan, as we call it in the industry, is going to show different things like what is a wall or a surface mounted fixture. And up above, you're going to see these symbols and below you're going to see the lights that they would correspond to. Um, you're going to think about recessed wall wash fixtures, pins and mounts. We look at track lighting. There's a different kind of symbol for track lighting versus a surface mounted fixture versus a recessed fixture. Under cabinet lighting has its own symbol. Um, and we also have to think about energy at the same time. And um, so we will notify where um, emergency fixtures or junction boxes occur. This is those exit signs I was talking about. And then another part of lighting design is understanding where your switches are going to be. I'm sure you've all been in an environment where you couldn't find the light switch or it was weirdly behind a door somewhere. Um, you know, lighting switches, lighting switch placement is an important part of the designers. Um, uh, they're problem solving. Dinner switches versus low voltage switches versus ceiling fans. Duplexes, single, quadruple, double. Um, we are uh, oftentimes integrating the switches and the electrical plans and the data plans um, together. So all of these different uh, contractors need to be able to work together because um, for an efficient and uh, cost-effective design, they're all going to kind of use the same wire placement. So it, it means that as a designer, you're working with several different industries to make sure that your design is going to work with the design that we've specified, for example, a computer layout of uh, a library. 
just a few more duplexes and what we all think of. You know, when you are looking at a light bulb. So now we've talked a little bit about some of the different things that um, we use to measure light, and they will show up on your label. So now when you're looking at an LED, which I hope everybody is uh, shopping for, um, you can think about the different ways that this LED is going to impact your space. And if you want something that's warm or something that's cooler, and you can... Um, understand the brightness of that particular bulb. And they will also give us um, a, uh, an energy efficiency um, uh, number or tag so that we can understand the most efficient lighting fixture that we can specify or that you can buy. And I encourage you as you are purchasing light bulbs to look at a couple of different light bulbs so you can compare these different uh, these different labels and see what your options are. 